We are moving to, or it's, it's part of the guidelines now in terms of eligible departments, meaning that it needs to be included in all um, organisations that have an ED. So I'll talk about that at the end. So I'm going to give um, a brief background and talk about where our resources or our ED self-assessment tool has come from, and then I'm going to talk about the fun part, which is implementation. Um, so basically a bit of background, and um, Andrew Stewartson did a wonderful talk last year that looked at the first stage of analysis in terms of the work that's been done in ED. But basically um, for those areas that had, or those organisations that had already been submitting data from their emergency departments over the period of the program, we, we had identified that emergency departments had always been substantially low and had always had trouble um, getting good hand hygiene compliance compared to other areas. Um, and in the initial stages, we've always sort of thought, well, that kind of makes sense. They're, you know, the front line, they're, they're life or death situations. And in a way, they were always put a little bit to the side and said, well, they're very different. But then um, we decided to look at why and try and understand that and to work out, actually, are they really different? Because everybody likes to think they're different and special, but is that really the case? So uh, Andrew Stewartson and Rhonda Stewart and a few other um, colleagues did an analysis, which the results were presented last year, of the existing national hand hygiene data set, as well as adding in some enhanced auditing and ED in some um, specific ED um, hospitals, uh, sorry, ED departments in some specific hospitals who were happy to do the additional um, specialised auditing to try and get a better understand of what, understanding of hand hygiene behaviour in that department as well as what hand hygiene resources and in particular ABHR placement was going on and also what activities in terms of promotion. And so what did they find? Well, they actually found out that yes, EDs are special. They are different, but not for the reasons that we actually thought. So first of all, we have always talked about ABHR placement as being challenging to be within the patient zone in the um, ED setting, in particular in regard, you know, can you put um, ABHR on the end of um, the beds, you can't screw them on, they move around, those sorts of things, that was always a thought that that was one of the issues. This idea of patient acuity, so that, you know, we are, that they are the front line in terms of um, trauma care, life-saving, cardiac, resus, that sort of thing. And also this idea that there's a lot of non-cooperative patients, so people who might be, um, uh, you know, suffering with for whatever reason and not able to cooperate at that point in time. So, but when we did the analysis, we found that that actually wasn't the case, that the analysis didn't support those things. But we did find other things were different. Um, and in particular, we found that the compliance rate of visiting healthcare workers, so healthcare workers that came into the department from outside, so should know better because they're working in the rest of the hospital, a bit like the ICU phenom phenomenon, I think, as well, um, that they came in and their compliance rates were lower than um, the other um, ED staff. Also found that ambulance staff had an extremely low compliance rate, which was um, impacting on the overall compliance, and that the other usual stuff was impacting as well in terms of the same pattern, in terms of moments, um, gloves, inappropriate glove use, and also that lower compliance by profession. So basically, once they'd done that, inf that work and we'd identified that there were different barriers in the ED setting, we identified or we realised that we needed to find a way to work out for EDs what are those modifiable barriers, what are those issues that are specific um, to them and how do they get across that so that they can work out ways to target those things. And so in the first instance, this work was aimed firstly to get the involvement of ED professionals, which was very, very important, um, and also to develop a new resource that would help organisations to do that. And so we worked with the Australasian College for Emergency Medicine and the College of Emergency Nursing um, and, we, and other um, people working in this space, as well as representation from the college, Infection Control College, um, and other ED staff. Um, and we formed what we called an ED working party and they were a fantastic group to work with. Um, and we developed this ED specific hand hygiene gap assessment, gap analysis or 
self-assessment frameworks, which you may be familiar with that terminology because there is a WHO self-assessment framework. So we based the ED self that was actually the very first point, was the WHO um, framework, and then we made it ED specific. So the benefits of it obviously is that it's systematic. It's based on those five um, different areas um, that Benedetta <coughs> referred to. Um, it's a validated tool, so we know that those are the things that are going to make a difference. Um, and um, we obviously worked with the working party to make sure that they were specific to the ED setting. And then the great thing was, was that we then had nine wonderful emergency departments across Australia from all different types of settings. So um, all, um, several jurisdictions, both private and public um, EDs. Um, and they all piloted and tested the tool for usability, which was fantastic. So this is our ED um, self-assessment framework. Um, it's very self-explanatory. It's very easy to work through, apparently, so the usability testing told us. Um, and basically, it works through each of the five areas as outlined in the WHO framework. Um, I will point out that there's two components to each of the five areas. One is stro strongly recommended and the other is for consideration. Activities that have a really strong evidence base sit in the strongly recommended section and the activities for consideration are those that have a lower level of ev evidence base but are still likely to um, really help with hand hygiene practices. So who should complete the ED SAF if you have an ED? Well, I actually went into an emergency department just a few weeks ago myself um, to help a colleague trying to work through their, um, through their challenges in the emergency department. And I would say that you would, you would, I would strongly recommend that you have someone from your emergency department do it with you. Um, it's, it's very, very important to do that. Um, and I also would suggest that an infection control practitioner be involved as well. Um, basically, you work through the tool, indicating which of the criteria are addressed. Um, one of the reasons we have built the SAF the way we have um, is so that if you identify a gap at that point of time, you can write your action plan at exactly the same time. So you can identify the issue, write an action plan together, which is why it is good to have someone from the emergency department with you when you're doing it. And um, the other thing is if you identify that there's no issues in your department and they're doing a wonderful job already, this is a really nice tool to actually um, record that and demonstrate that, say for accreditation or something like that, which you might feel like you need documentation for. So it's. Um, all built in the one form, one bit of paperwork to try and make things easier for people. From today, very exciting, um, you will be able to find it on our website. So it's under our um, resources for healthcare workers section, under auditing, and if you scroll down you'll find it about halfway down the page. <clears throat> so moving forward from here, what do we do? So as we said, from July 2017, emergency departments are now part of the eligible departments, which means that they need to be audited in all, er in all organisations who have an ED. If you don't have an ED, you don't need to worry. Um, but this does mean that if you are not yet auditing your emergency department and you do have one, you will need to add them to your schedule. So it's part of the validation process that we now make sure that um, all organisations who have an emergency department have that as an active department. Um, and as Lindsay mentioned, just be aware that this may have an impact on your overall hospital compliance. So if you think, um, if you've never been into your emergency department or you've never audited in there, you might find it a bit of a shock when you go in and it may have an impact overall. So this might be a really nice place to start if you've not got much going on in there or you're looking to ramp things up because you've identified it as a bit of an issue, the ED SAF would be a really nice tool that you could use to start that process off. Or if you're facing some of the challenges that we've talked about already. Do you, did anyone have any questions? Yep. With the numbers, yes. Them. Yes. How long have you been there? Um, so we actually had, yes, so we actually did have people from, 
I can't, I don't know what it's called ambulance in Victoria. Victoria. Ambulance Victoria, because we had people from Queensland Ambulance Service and Ambulance Victoria involved as well. And they are extremely keen to be involved. So you, I would think that as a depart or as a service, you would have a liaison person that you would be able to contact. Do but you know I, better I, about I, that? I do think, I think you're right. So, you know, up until now, we've been focusing on um, communicating the results within the institution and these outside institutions, and I think the overall rate that we're looking at around five yeah, five percent. You know, five percent for ambulance officers. Like <laughs> this is seriously bad. Um, you know, we we do need a palatable <coughs> way of telling them that their rates suck. Really. But, and, uh, but in saying that, I have to tell you, in the emergency department that I've recently been to visit, when I came through and looked through the section where the ambos walked through, there was not a single bottle of alcohol-based alcohol hand rub. Not one single one. And if I was an ambulance officer, there's no way I'd do my hands either. So there, there is a system change that needs to be there. And we've also got them coded completely separately now for that purpose. But they're, but they're all wearing gloves. Yeah. So, and that's the other thing. There was nowhere for them to put their gloves. So there was no bins, nothing for them to put their gloves into, and no alcohol-based hand rub. So they're like this. Even if they wanted to do it, they couldn't. So I think, I think it's like other elements of the healthcare system, isn't it? Everyone's doing health not because they're lazy or don't care. They do care. We just need to identify the issues that can be fixed and then support them to do it. Um, so you're talking about met calls that happen outside of immediate. Our HHA's recommendations have always been that in that sort of situation you would not audit. If someone's having a met call situation or indeed a code situation, that the best thing you can do is, is if you're not going to assist, to remove yourself from the situation. We've never ever recommended auditing in those circumstances. And it would be the same in, in EDs. If you've got someone who's being resuscitated or in a resus room being resuscitated, you would not be auditing in that area. More than actually, you'll hear the numbers in a second, but actually there are some EDs who are doing really well with their percentages. So it's not like it's, they can't do it. So some can and some can't. 